You can hear me. I'm Howard Scott Warshaw. And I'm going to chat with you a bit for the next 45 minutes. And this should be interesting. So a question that has come up a lot recently that I keep getting is, are you going to do any more 2600 games? Because now people do 2600 work. There's homebrews and things. But the question people keep saying is, are you going to redo ET? <laughs> and, no, it's OK. There's nothing, you know. I, if I were going to come back and do a 2600 game, I really don't think I would redo ET. I mean, ET is done. Yeah. Or it was done. And you can stick a fork in it, as many people have over the years. But if I were actually, if I were going to do another 2600 game, I would do Yars too. I would do a sequel to Yars Revenge. Because that's a game. Ah, thank you. Because that's a game design that I've actually had. Whoa. All right. For a second, I thought I woke up. That's a game that I've had a design for for a long time. And I just thought it'd be really interesting to do. And I've still never seen that gameplay done. So I have one gameplay in 30 years you know, that I've come up with. So that's what I would do. So one thing I'm very curious about is how many of you have seen the documentary Atari Game Over? OK, so you know about that. How many of you have seen the angry video game nerd movie? Wow, so this is a well-screened crowd, as they say. So that's cool. And one thing is, I can talk and chat about a bunch of things, but usually this gets pretty interesting when we start doing questions. Do, do any of you have questions that you brought to the session that you'd like to ask me? Excellent. Then we will get to those questions. <laughs> and in fact, we could get to some of them right now. How many of you want to hear a lecture versus you want to start a Q&A right away? How many people want to hear a Q&A right away? And let's just get into it. How many people want to hear a three-minute lecture before we start the Q&A? Excellent. So, what do you want to hear about? Playboy. Playboy was an interesting thing, and that's a, that's a good one. I recently appeared in Playboy magazine, which as a youth, I spent, well, it was all digital. But uh, it's really funny, because in my youth, I spent a lot of time trying to acquire copies of Playboy. I never dreamed I would wind up in a copy of Playboy. But, and it was an interview that was done a while ago around the uh, digging up of the carts in New Mexico. And I, it wasn't really done for Playboy. It was done by just some freelance uh, journalist that called me up for an interview and they wrote up the interview. And I guess ultimately they were able to place it with Playboy. And so somebody sent me a link saying, hey, guess what? You know, you're in Playboy. I'm like, no, really? That's so cool. I was really, Really excited about that. And, but I just heard that Playboy is now <laughs> canceling the, uh, the picture portion of their publication. They are no longer going to publish pictures. Now, it, it, now people will honestly read it for the articles, which is amazing. But what it makes me think is like I am like the black thumb of everything, OK? Because I did ET, right? And that was the end of the video game industry as we knew it, supposedly. So then, you know, they did Atari Game Over. They did that documentary. And that documentary was funded by Microsoft Studios. And as soon as that documentary was done, Microsoft Studios closed. They got shut down. You know, it was unbelievable. I thought, really? And so now I finally, I appear in Playboy magazine in an article. And now they're pulling all the pictures and redoing Playboy is like, wow. You know, I feel like I should be at the Republican National Convention. <laughs> so it's, a, it's been a pretty interesting journey. And my experience, particularly at the dig, was very interesting. It really caught me by surprise. Because I didn't know what to expect. Because I've been saying, I'm well documented over 30 years saying, I do not believe the games are there. I never believed the company that was failing financially would actually spend the money to go take product that's deemed worthless because we're going to dump it and spend the extra money to go ship it way out in the desert and bury it and then bulldoze it and concrete over it and all this stuff. I just thought, that doesn't make sense. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And then what I realized, but what I realized was that when you expect things to make sense, you're really losing touch with Atari. 
And that's one of the things that made Atari such a cool place to be, because it wasn't about making sense. It was about making fun and trying to figure out how to do that. So, and then, you know, people always go, wow, you had six weeks to do that game? I go, ah, oh, no, that would have been great. You know, I had five weeks to do the game. You know, and I spent like six months on Yars, and I spent like 10 months on Raiders. And there's a thing about productivity, okay? So, the thing is, like, E.T., a lot of people say, well, that's my worst game. And, you know, how many, how many of you have said, have actually spoken the words, E.T. is the worst video game of all time. Never. No. It's okay if you have it. I am not sensitive about E.T. Believe me, I've been through this enough already. But it's like, it's okay. Because I was curious, how many of you have actually played E.T.? Yeah. Interesting. Because sometimes a lot of the people who are really down on E.T., somebody brought this up to me once, it's like they really haven't played it. So I became like, I'm, I'm a pioneer of social media as well because I became a lightning rod for haters, apparently. <laughs> and so that was kind of interesting to see that, but I was thinking about this productivity thing. So what does productivity mean when you're producing a game, right? You can work on a game longer and you can work on a game shorter and it doesn't necessarily impact the quality of the game. You can make it too short and definitely impact the quality of the game. But what's funny is like if I work three years on a game and it's not fun, well that wasn't very productive, that wasn't very effective. And if it takes me like three months to produce a game that's, that's enjoyable, that's a lot of fun, well, that was good time. But there's a lot of types of software production you can measure productivity for, and fun, producing fun, you just can't. Because that's a thing that comes from inspiration. And inspiration is something I really looked at and studied, and I'm very into it now, because now, and many of you know, I am now actually a psychotherapist. I am a licensed psychotherapist in California. So, which means I used to, entertain nerds and now I try to actually genuinely make their lives better. Although some people say, well, maybe the reason you really became a therapist was because I felt guilty about all the depression and anxiety I generated with the game that I made. So maybe I'm trying to compensate for that. You know, we're all trying to compensate for something. So, and the transition from programmer to therapist, a lot of people don't understand that. They think that's an odd shift. You know, particularly if you take the typical, stereotypical view of programmers, these are not people people, as it were. But to me, it was the most natural thing in the world, right? Because if you think about it, programmers and therapists, they're all systems engineers, right? It's just that I moved on to a much more complicated hardware, <laughs> if Joe DeCure will actually acknowledge that. Yeah. So... Okay, who's got questions? <laughs> Sir, you were right up front. Hi, so uh, first of all, I didn't know that E.T. was a bad game until the internet told me it was. Me neither. <laughs> I was a kid, I was born in 74, and you know, had an Atari in the early days. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was just another game. I'll, I'll tell you that the, when my mom was in the market, it was a Friday, and what, was it Firefly? People have cited Firefly as competition for ET in the worst game department. Well, that's a whole other realm, but ET was in a hole. <laughs> that's really hard to say, and it's a good question. You know, and I, I hear this a lot. So if you had more time, what would you have done? Okay, the first thing I would have done was fix the pits. I would have fixed it so you don't just keep falling in the pits. I would have taken that out of the play. And I would have fixed it so, see, here's the thing with ET that I think, when I look back and I say, what's wrong with ET? And the thing is that in video games, in my opinion, as a designer, that frustration is a good thing in a video game. That's what games are all about, frustration. But disorientation, that's not a good thing. Right, in a good video game, frustration is when you know what you're trying to do, but you can't quite do it, okay? And in a game, that's it. When you're not succeeding in a game, you should understand what you're trying to do. You're just not, you're, I've got to work on my skill level. I've got to get that together. I know I can get there, I'm just not there yet. 
But disorientation is where suddenly I failed in the game, but I don't know why I failed. I just wound up someplace that's crazy. And ET offered a lot of opportunities to disorient the user. I think that was a no-no, and that was a mistake. So what I would do, you know, to answer your question more directly is just, I would remove the disorienting factors first. I would fix some of the ridiculously frustrating aspects and the counterintuitive aspects of it. But to tell you the truth, that probably would have taken about three days. If I had six months, then the game would have gone to a different place. You see, here's the thing with ET. The problem with ET is that I delivered virtually 100% of my concept. Okay, that's the problem with ET. And here's what I mean by that. It's like in most creative development, you start off with a concept, and if if it's worthwhile, if you have a good team, you have good people, and you have creative people working on it, that concept is just a starting point. And you evolve from that, and you grow from that, and you examine it, and you find out what's wrong with it, and what's going on, and you adjust it, and you address it. And new things you never thought of in the original concept come in and get merged in, and it becomes more and more and more. But in terms of realizing the original design concept, you, re you realize less and less and less. But you should. Right? Because hopefully the things you're doing as you're moving away from the original design concept are improvements on the original design concept. The problem with the five-week development schedule is I had time to do first playable. And ET was released as a first playable. That's really what happened with ET. So there wasn't a testing cycle, there was not a tuning cycle, a lot of that stuff. If I would have had another week, okay, well that would have been a 20% increase in the schedule. Right? And so we probably wouldn't have had time to do a lot of testing and things like that. It was, it was tough. But if I had more time, you know, what would the game look like? I don't know. But I know it would probably be very different. A lot of things would have gotten polished. A lot of things would have gotten honed. I think some of the original concept would have been preserved. But the timing of things, the way they were represented. I'll tell you a thing in, of late that I've been thinking is one thing that I really missed the boat on with ET that I maybe could have done is I should have made it the game that tells you how to play it. Because we had the six character kernel and you could put text in it. I didn't have a tremendous amount of memory, but I had some memory to play with. And I, if I could have put in a few phrases like fine phone pieces or something like that and what, do one of the first games that actually instructs you, at least on the VCS, how to play it, I think that would have made a big difference. And I also could have said, you know, like, get out of the damn holes. That would have been a nice thing to put in also. But also, and, and is it the worst game of all time? I, I really don't believe, honestly, that E.T. is the worst game of all time, going back to Firefly and stuff like that. But I prefer it when people identify it as the worst game. I really do. Because I like breadth. I like to do a lot of different things. I like to go in a lot of different directions. And the one thing that E.T. has really done for me, as long as it's the worst game, right, is, you know, I have Yars Revenge also. So, one of the best games. So I have the greatest range of any designer in history, <laughs> right? So that's the way I've come to hold it. You know, I have one game in the New York Museum of, the Museum, the, the, you know, the Museum of Modern Art, the New York Museum of Modern Art. I have one game there. I have another game that's the subflooring of the New Mexico desert. <laughs> so it's range, it's breadth. It just makes me feel good to know that I'm in different places at different times. And it's, uh, so that's fun. Does that answer your question? What a great question. What a good crowd. I wrote every bite of E.T. fresh. If you really look at it carefully, you will notice that it's not the same kernel. See, Raiders, I want it to be one of the biggest adventure games. And I'm saying that staring at David Crane, who wrote Pitfall, which certainly has the most number of screens. I wanted to create a big experience. But it's all two-line res kernels, right? And that's what I did. I traded off resolution for the ability to create different scenarios and try to generate different stuff. And that was my goal. With ET, you'll notice it's a, the characters are in one line res. There are some two line res elements, and there's a lot of play field involved, like there was in Raiders. But the, the characters are all one line res, because I wanted to have the best graphic impression I could get on characters that are running around the screen, because my con see, there was a number of issues with ET. One is like Raiders, 
You want, okay, do a video game for Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's a great movie. It's an action movie. It's got a through line. It has a goal and a course, you know, a, a path right to the goal. It's naturally made for like an action adventure scenario. Okay. E.T. doesn't have that. E.T. is a game that people love. But it's an emotional tone movie. It's not an action adventure movie. There's some action in it. But it's mostly about emotional tone and caring. So I thought to myself, well, what I need to do is create a, a 2600 game that people identify with to the point where they create emotional connection with the characters. Which, you know, when I look back on it, I think, are you out of your mind? You know, that's crazy. You're not going to do that on the 2600. But you couldn't tell me not to do it, right? And so that's what I tried to do. I don't think it worked. But that's where I was coming from. You know, you have to realize that I'm coming from kind of a crazy place if I'm signing up to do that game in five weeks in the first place. But I really believed I could do it. You know, and the key thing to doing a game in five weeks is not to do a game that's designed to take six months to do in five weeks. It's design a game you can do in five weeks, and that's also how I approached it. But I still put like a 3D world in, I tried to do, because I have to do something fresh in every game, and then the reason there's so many pits is just to make a randomizing factor to give the game legs. I put a puzzle I could regenerate at random every time you restart, and so it's a fresh game play each time. That was, that was what I was trying to achieve. Well, thank you. I hope your mind got blown in a good way. Thank you. And I like your t-shirt. I saw the Ramones in uh, McAllister Auditorium at Tulane University in 1977. It was... Uh... Cool. They were probably older then. I think I was too. Yes. Okay, that's a very good question. A lot of people say, yeah, why is E.T. green and stuff? So you have to understand that we made these games and we had to internationalize them, which just meant they had to go on PAL systems, which have a slightly different color palette, and they have to be okay on black and white. I had a graphics designer who was an excellent graphics designer who, not many people knew this about him, but he was actually colorblind, which is an interesting thing in a graphics designer. But it didn't completely negate his ability to do this, but he made the color choices for that. And to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't care. I was totally fine with turning that over and letting him make those choices because I laid out the design for where stuff needed to be. And like with the characters, what I did was I just said, I'm going to give you this many pixels. You're going to have one line resolution. Make the prettiest character you can and give me the animation. Because I didn't care. Because to me, it's the block. I'll just do the collision detect. I'm going to run and implement the game. And he's going to put, produce the graphic components. And I'm just going to plug them in. And I, I was never disappointed with them. I mean, on the forest scene, I did think, wow, that's a lot of green. But it's. You know, it was he was going for a, a negative space kind of thing, you know. And we know we were all nuts with design, right? We were all thinking, oh, we've got the most innovative stuff. This is the most amazing breakthrough thing. And I really believe that's what was happening. Okay. So it was exciting and we were breaking ground and oh my God, we only have a week and a half left. So <laughs> it was uh, you know, that's the way it came down, is you know, my graphic designer, a guy named Jerome Demura, okay, who did a lot of really good work at Atari. You see his stuff in most of my games, a lot of other games. And in fact, as far as I know, he is the only graphics designer from Atari who has an Easter egg where you can find his initials in a game also. Because uh, his initials, I put those in ET also. You can find those if you know the magic formula. Because I did go nuts with the Easter eggs. Yeah, even though I only had five weeks, I still had time to put my name in the game. Yeah, that's a good question also. Yes, sir. That's a really fundamental question. I mean, 
you always look back and think, wow, if I would have had tremendous more resources, I could have done so much better, okay? But for me, when you, when you give me that question, which is a good question, the part that I think of is, wow, if we had those kind of resources, I would have been competing against much better games too, right? Because, because if I was the only one who had the extra resources on that machine, well, that would have been an interesting world. Then I should have been producing like the best games, you know, if you have better resources. But it's tough to say, it's tough to compare. I mean, the thing that I think, I, I said it this morning, right, you think about, uh, we had 4K, and if we were lucky, we got jumped up to 8K to make a game. So that's the whole game, right? That's smaller than data structures are in individual games now. It's not unusual for a game now to be released on a disc that's about 4 gig, right? That's a million times 4K, right? So games are literally a million times bigger if you look at their data space now, than they were back then. Are they a million times more fun? I hope so. That would be cool, but it's hard to gauge. But the scale of how this advances is incredible. It's mind-boggling. So to try and go back and say it, and, and to be perfectly honest with you, I kind of, I didn't spend as much time wishing I had more stuff. I liked the challenge of working on that limited system. When I first showed up at Atari, uh, a guy named Dennis Coble, was the manager, and I went in and talked to Dennis, and he said, so what do you want to work on? And I'm like, really? And you know, I get my choice? And I thought about it, and I said to him, I said, what's the dirtiest, ugliest, most primitive machine that you have? And he goes, that's the 2600. I said, that's what I want to work on. Because what I didn't want to do was start working on one machine and then have to go down to a crappier machine. I wanted to start on the crappy machine, and then if I was going to switch machines, I'd be moving up, because I don't like stepping back. So that's how I chose the 2600 to work on. But I liked it when I started to see it and go on because I came from an economics background, which is a typical. There weren't a lot of typical backgrounds, though, with people there. People had all kinds of backgrounds. It was really interesting. But I came back from economics. And a lot of people think of economics as money. But it's not. Economics is about resource allocation, about the allocation of scarce resources. That's what economics is about. And so I had this background and this sort of a knack for working with limited resources and they go, well, you know, you only have a 28 by 128 bytes of RAM, you know, and you probably have throughput, you only have like 75%, 75% of the time, you're just drawing your picture on the screen, right? You're not processing the game, you're drawing the game on the screen. So you only have 25% of your duty cycle to actually do your logic. How do you like that? Well, I like it. I like that challenge. For me, that was great. That was enticing. So it really got me engaged, it got me interested. And then when we started to have the opportunity to work on other machines, I was not that anxious to do it. For one thing, the 2600 had a much bigger market than the other machines did, but it was also, I liked the challenge of doing it, of trying to keep pushing that machine farther. And there really wasn't a force at Atari saying, we must be moving forward, we've got to hit the next generation, which was one of the biggest problems at Atari. There was no real voice at Atari that was heard that said, we've got to really create the next generation. It was the worst first product life cycle in a lot of industries. Maybe at the time you you had seen the release of this, this other game, and then like, you know, why did this 
become one of the most recognized, most popular games versus this thing I did, which is a rudimentary version of it that went the complete opposite direction. Well, I'd say part of it was the experience of the players you know, <laughs> on some levels. But OK, so I did a lot of revolutionary stuff. I did a lot of breakthrough stuff because that's what I did. Because fundamentally, I'm an insecure person who needs to distinguish themselves. And so when I showed up at Atari, you look at Yar's Revenge. Yar's Revenge has a lot of firsts. There are a lot of things that happened for the first time in Yar's Revenge. And they became industry standards. Yar's Revenge is the first video game that has a pause in it. Okay, it's the first full screen explosion, you know. It's the first thing where it was a marketed Easter egg, right? It was the first thing that really integrates sounds. It was one of the first games to have no frame and just have a totally black background, which, you know, and that, these were design choices that I made, right? Because I felt they enhanced the game and I'd never seen them before. Because when I'm going to do something like this, when you give me the opportunity to reach an audience with something, anything, like hand me a microphone, for instance, you know, I want to do something. I want to do something that's different, that people are going to notice. They're going to sit up and go, oh, that's interesting. You know, it was the first game to put the actual code on screen. You know, so Yars did a lot of that stuff. And then Raiders, again, I wanted it to be a huge game with different plays and different themes and stuff going through and secrets and all that stuff. And that was big, so I tried to do that. With E.T., although I only had five weeks, I still wanted to make it a breakthrough game. So I, create, I wanted to do some interesting stuff. So I made it like a 3D world. And I had indicators and stuff. What? Was there a game with headphones that had screen set up? Was that no. I, didn't, I mean, I don't think I saw that anywhere else. I don't think there were many games that had done that previously. A lot of games did it subsequently. It's a logical thing to do, right? But I mean, a lot of times we see our world is full of things that make sense when we see them. That's what good design is, I think. If you look at it, you go, well, of course that's what you do. That makes perfect sense. Except so at some point, somebody had to be the first one to put it there. So I tried to do that. For me, my goal wasn't just to make a game. I wanted to make a game out of components that people hadn't seen. So I would find new ways to tweak graphics registers and do stuff like that to produce interesting effects to enhance the gameplay. And with ET, what I wanted, what I was trying to do with the bar at the top, I was trying to do a thing where you have status indicators so that, see, the biggest problem that I always faced with designing games for 2600 is the controller is so limited. That was a curse, but it was also a blessing. Okay? And so, because I think really good game design happens when you take a game objectives and instead of accomplishing them with a button push, you accomplish them with a game mechanic. And that was the lesson I learned in Yara's Revenge. And I was trying to apply that concept in ET. So I don't have a lot of controller options. So in Raiders, I went through this thing of using both joysticks, which was also an innovation and a problem. Because nobody expects to take two joysticks to play a game. So most people plug one joystick in, because it's a one-player game. There's no reason to think you need both joysticks. And they start playing. And the way I was thinking was, so I made player two the motion joystick. So people who just plugged it into player one, it wouldn't work. And they'd know something was wrong. We also went through the first wave of, hey, there's something wrong with this game. So you know, these were not necessarily strokes of genius. Some of these were problems I was creating. Okay, But it was important to me to push this stuff through, to push boundaries through. Now I help people defend boundaries, but I used to be very much about busting through them. Okay, So that's why I have a lot of insight into that. And that's what I was trying to achieve. I was trying to find a context-sensitive way of giving you powers. It was like an early version of the concept of a power up. You know, if you go and stand in this place, you'll now have this power. When you stand over here, you'll have this power, and you needed an indicator to let you know where that was. And I think I overdid it in ET. I would have gotten rid of a lot of them and just had a few spots that made sense. And it would have popped out at you more. It would have been a better interface, probably. But does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Good. I've always wanted to ask you this question. <laughs> well, I've always wanted to answer it. I just didn't know that until right now. <laughs> and blue shirt first, and uh, then next. The ET screen, the title screen looks fantastic. I mean, so much so that I think it sets up a little bit of disappointment when you get into the game. Really? I hope that's the only thing that creates disappointment in the game. <laughs> That was good. I almost caught the water through my nose. No, there, it wasn't that there was a tremendous amount of extra space. It wasn't that expensive a graphic, 
really, but it was just my designer. What we, we felt having a real big splash title screen would be a nice thing to do. So I made the room for it. I thought it was an important thing to have, that, to have that kind of impact. So we put the song in, we put that screen in, and frankly, with the time frame that I was working in, I was okay with saying, let's allocate a chunk of memory here and I'll write less. So that was okay. But I also had designed the game that didn't have to take a tremendous amount of space to do. It was a very simple game concept. Right? I just hoped it had enough legs to, to, to live. And uh, it had enough legs to walk off a cliff, apparently, and fall in a big pit. Well, I remember... Uh, I playing, of course, 2,600 games. I don't remember the first time I got eaten by a dragon in Adventure, but I do remember the first time suddenly Yara's Revenge slashed HSWWSH on it, or when I was playing ET and suddenly a yellow Yar flew up to the top, and I remember thinking, I'm repeating myself, you did not imagine that, you did not imagine that. <laughs> well, I, I will admit I'm an English player, <coughs> but if you only had 4K to put a game together, um, were those Easter eggs initially done with the knowledge of the higher-ups? Did they think that that would be a good marketing choice, or did you just sneak them in, and suddenly they found out about it when they hit the market? Uh, Yara's Revenge was the only one that got approved, but I was able to talk marketing into it, because originally my concept was to sneak it in, and usually we did sneak them in. The origin of Easter eggs at large is Warren Robinette in Adventure, right? But the reason for that, though, there was a good reason for it, because Atari did not publish the names of the programmers who did the games. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to have some kind of a mechanism. It was decided. You know, in the programs, we need a mechanism of ensuring that if it's ever a question of my authorship, I want to be able to prove it beyond any reason, reasonable doubt. Okay? And the great thing is to put your name in it, right? Because if someone else did this game, why would they put my name in it, right? So, so that was the thing, and it was done secretly. Some people would just put ASCII strips inside the code. So if you disassembled the cart, you could find it. Some people hid their names or their initials or things like that in it. I tried to make it part of the gameplay, like with Yard's Revenge. It's a big thing about the backstory that it reflects the name of the CEO of the company spelled backwards, right? So the reason I put HSWWSH was that when you find it, it's a key to tell you that if you reverse things in the namings of the game, you might find some interesting things. I don't know how interesting it really was, but it's a cool concept. So that was Yars. But then when I got to Raiders, I decided I want to have a scheme for how I'm going to sign my games. So, and when it comes to like signing my work, then I'm going to put a lot of thought into that. So <laughs> I decided that what I would do is in each game that I did subsequently, you would be able to find an HSW with the number of the game, and you would find the main character from each of my previous games in it. It does not take a lot of memory to put up a graphic for Indiana Jones or a YAR or things like that, that's really like 16, 20 bytes, and the logic to actually make it show up is literally another five or six bytes in some cases. It doesn't take a lot to do it once you have all the other infrastructure built. So that's what I did. So in Raiders, you can find an Indiana, you can find a YAR that'll fly out of the well, and you can find an HSW2 in the game. In ET, you can find an HSW3. ET, I kind of went nuts with this because it was just easy to do. So in ET, here's the signatures in ET. I don't know if you found all of them yet. You can find an HSW3 because it's my third game. You can find a YAR that flies out of the well. You can turn the flower. The flower was the key. I just kept changing the pointer to what the flower graphics point to. So it'll turn into a YAR and it'll fly out. Then on a later round, it'll turn into Indiana Jones. You can find the uh, initials of the graphics designer. And if that's not enough, if you look carefully at the phone pieces, if you look at the graphics for the phone pieces, one is an H, one is an S, and the other one is a W. They're just turned on their sides or bent a little bit. So I just kept finding ways to put that in, in ways that didn't really cost anything more, but it just, because they still just look like pieces, but it meant something to me. Mr. Zadibble. Some executive, you know, 
Well, Rob and I, you know, we could talk a lot about responsibility. <laughs> but uh, the truth is, I didn't invent Easter eggs. I feel like I innovated with Easter eggs. So there. <laughs> but uh, what well, you just said, how do I feel about creating? Uh, if I did something to make Easter eggs a bigger part of it, then, and this is the honest truth about it. You ready? Because you're going to love this. I'm so, in, I'm so glad that you asked this. Do you know who asked this question? This is Rob Zadibble, a guy who was one of my Atari co-programmers. And there's Todd Fry, too. And Bob Smith is here. Here's David Crane. There are some great veterans here right now. But there was a guy named Rob Zadibble, who's not the guy who's sitting right here. This guy was many years ago. He was, you know, looked pretty much the same. But, and what he used to say is that, you know, there's gaming and there's metagaming. And metagaming is the thing that you really get somewhere with a game if you get people to have something about the game to deal with and to talk about. And I had heard you talk about that a number of times. And that's actually more the inspiration because Easter egg is the easiest way on the 2600 to get to metagaming, right? Because there wasn't an internet, there wasn't ways of disseminating all this stuff, but if you had something that, thought there might be a rumor, there's something else to find in the game, there's something else going on, which Adventure had already established really well. Right? I thought, I, I think that's a great way to generate this metagaming thing. So that was really the idea with it. And I just got bigger and bigger with the concept and we got to each one. And then even in Saboteur, you know, which wasn't officially released until 20 years after Atari you know, VCS department shut their doors, I still had Yars flying back and forth occasionally in the opening screen where things are running back and forth. It was just a great legacy thing. I like the idea of all the games being tied to each other. People go, oh, look at that. There's that thing. You know, in Atari Game Over, you know the, the documentary, Atari Game Over, you saw, you saw Ernest Klein, right, the guy who wrote Ready Player One and Armada. So what did he say? He said, you know, he was playing E.T. He goes, the first time he saw that flower turn into a yar and fly out of the well, he goes, I, I shit myself. I didn't know what to do. It was, un it was this great moment for him. And he talked about that. He's still talking about this, this thing that happened all that time ago. I consider that to be a contribution to the game experience. And so I'm proud of that. So no, I don't feel bad about it at all. I think that was time well spent. Does that answer your question, sir? Thank you. And thank you for that question. Yes? Um, after ED sort of kind of caused the unending gaming crash, at what point do you think people started to take, uh, I guess, the general <coughs> started to take gaming seriously then, not just as that bad from the early 80s that crashed in Berkeley after ED? Well, that's an interesting question because, you know, you know, there's two kinds of people in the world. There's people who divide the world into two kinds of people and people who don't. Right? But there's another two kinds of two kinds of people. And that is, there are people who believed that games were a fad and they were dying and they were going away and people who didn't. And I think a lot of us who were involved in making games never really believed this was it, this was the end of games. Video gaming was too big a thing, it was too intense a thing. But what we weren't really tuning into was the idea that no matter how cool something is, people acclimate to it and they get sick and tired of it. Right? And that's what it is. We didn't produce new stuff. We kept trying to innovate with the same hardware. We never took the big step forward. And so Nintendo did. You know, theoretically we did with the machines that we were releasing late, but it was too little, too late. People were too uh, disheartened in some ways with what went on. But it wasn't that many years later. It was only a couple of years later Nintendo released this thing and people are nuts for it again because this was fresh and there it was. Nowadays, when someone introduces a machine, a new machine, they already have the next machine in design, right? You begin your product life cycle with the concept for the next product life cycle. That was not happening back then, and that's the thing that was missing. But it was, you know, there's another programmer, Matt Hubbard, who worked at Atari, he used to say, this definition of state of the art means when it's broke, nobody knows how to fix it. We didn't know what we were doing. Nobody knew what was going on. Nolan Bush now, right, who is probably one of the key people in terms of organizing and putting this whole thing together and getting it out there, obviously did not know what he had, okay? Because Nolan, Nolan is not an idiot in business, okay? And he sold a company for $22 million that within a couple of years 
was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Nobody does that if they have any inkling that that's what's going to happen. Okay, so this was the tiger that everybody was trying to grab by the tail. And when we look back on it now, we say, oh, well, this crashed the industry and killed it, and was it a fad, and stuff like that. And nobody really wants to say, you know, I did it. You know, I'll be happy to stand up and say, yes, I single-handedly, with 8K of code, toppled a billion dollar industry. I did that. That's cool. Right? But there's a, I think it's an Arabic uh, expression that says that uh, success has a thousand fathers, but failure is an orphan, right? And that was going on. When Atari was doing well, everybody was taking credit for it, and they should. You know, the guy who was the head, the CEO of the company was showing up and flying to Warner headquarters once a year to receive a huge bonus check, saying, thanks for doing such a great job. And he didn't sit there and go, you know, that's very nice of you, but I really didn't have much to do with it. He said, thank you very much. See you next year. But when things turned down, it took them about four or five months to fire him and bring someone else in because they realized he didn't know what to do. And they brought in someone else who didn't know what to do. And they went through a couple of people who really didn't know what to do because nobody knew what to do. But no one wanted to believe that no one knew what to do. And that is an interesting phenomena, I think, of the industry. Now at least people know what not to do. Thank you. Uh, John Mayer from Lost Art. And I thought it was a pretty epic, epic fun adventure game. Uh, time, absolutely. Uh, well, thank you. You said it was a pretty fun, epic adventure game, right? Yes. I just want to make sure I heard that correctly. That is correct. <laughs> No, no, you, that's a misunderstanding. I had plenty of time to do Raiders, because I was already working on, Yours Revenge was principally done in about six months. It wasn't released until about 12 months. But during the time where it was kind of done but not released, I was already working on Raiders. I spent nine or 10 months. Raiders was the longest game for me. I put a lot of time into that game, because I was trying to do a lot, and I just, you know, it just took a long time to put that together. And I had to eat up all the time, so when it was time to do ET, there wasn't much left. That was a very important part of working on Raiders. But uh, yours was an interesting thing, though, in terms of testing. Yours was the most tested video game, I think, in history. Have you guys heard this story? Do you want to hear this story? So this is interesting, because there was a vendetta kind of thing going on. There was someone who was trying to kill Yars or Ven. I don't know why, but it was happening. So Yars was all set, and there was this one person who had some influence in the company who was saying, and eh, you know who this person is, but it's, and they said, well, there's a problem with the, the playability of this game. We need to test. So they put it in focus groups, and it did really well in the focus groups. We go, okay, here we go. Now, at the same time, I had put my heart and soul into this game, and this was my chance, right? Because the, the big thing about making video games, at least it certainly was then, I think it still is now, is that at some point you get to go into a store. You get to see people playing your game. That's cool. I still get choked up thinking about that. Because it was just an amazing thing to think, I did this thing, then they ran it through this huge manufacturing machine, and it comes out the other side, and there it is in stores. And there's my thing. I did this, and it's on the shelf, and people are playing it. And if they're enjoying it, that's even better. But if they're not, I'm not going to tell them I did it, but they're still playing it. And that's cool. That's just a cool experience. That's the big rush. You know, you talk about drugs at Atari. The main drug at Atari was this thing of having the opportunity to see people love your work. That was huge. Joe? If I can add to that, the day after, Chris, after Thanksgiving, they now call it Black Friday, in 1977, right? The BCS is just introduced. And they've got a Sears store in Mountain View, California, and they've got this game set out there. They nailed it all down so nobody can steal any piece of it. I go there, and for an hour and a half, I watch a crowd of children around this machine taking their turns to play this game, complaining loudly if their parents wanted to drag them away. I love the fact that people could walk up and just figure out how to play it by watching somebody else play it. I walked home, and I thought, oh my god, we really are going to succeed. That was the highest high, other than the birth of my own children. 
Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing experience. And if you have the kind of passion that needs that kind of validation, Atari was a place to find it, and you could get it there. And I never knew about that until I showed up at Atari, and then when I realized I was there and this was it, that I wanted it. I wanted it bad, because I'm very passionate about this kind of stuff. And so here it was, and I had finished my game, and now I'm waiting. So where's the payoff? Where's this thing? Like the game's done. Okay, so I went to a focus test. I went to the focus test. People liked the game. So I'd go back to Mark and I'd go, okay, put it out there. I want, I, I, want to, I, I want to see the game. Come on, put it out. And they're like, well, there's still some questions about it. What? You did the test? That, no, nope, there were still some questions about it. Okay, so they did more focus testing. And I, every test they did, I would go to the test. I would watch it. I would sit behind the two-way mirror, and I'd be like sweating bullets. And here it is. And, it's, and people liked it. People really liked it. And okay, here we go. Let's release the game. But they would not release the game because, no, there are still some questions about this game. And so this went on for a while and a while. And then finally they came to the ultimate test. They came to the play test. Focus test, you have eight to 12 people, and they come in, they play the game, they eat some pizza, they get 50 bucks, and they chat with you about the game. In a play test, they bring in over 100 people, and they have them sit down, and they play game A, and they play game B. And then they rate them both, and they compare them. So, okay, so we're going to do the play test. They're going to do it in Seattle. So I made sure I was in Seattle for this test. And we go up, and the big thing with the play test is who are you testing against, right? Because you don't want to test against, like, a really great game, because that's, like, not fair. You know, they always say, if you're going to be the best, you have to beat the best. And that was not my mindset. I'm thinking, I want a crappy game to test against. If I would have had ET out already, I would have wanted to test against ET. <laughs> that would have been a great thing to do. So I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and then here it is. And the game they chose to play test Yars Revenge against was Missile Command for the 2600. <laughs> the number one game on the system. And I thought, oh, Jesus, I'm screwed. This was like unbelievable. I'm thinking all I want is to have all the ego gratification I've been promising myself, and no one will give it to me. And this was just horrible. And so we went through this, and I sat there, and I was right there in the room behind the glass watching it, and I was tabulating the sheets as they came in. The first sheet comes in, and it was not good. And I thought, oh. But then the sheets kept coming in. It was better, and it was better, and it was better. When the dust cleared, it beat Missile Command. And I thought, oh, Jesus, thank you, thank you. Now can we release this game? And they said, yeah. <laughs> so at that point, the, the voice of dissent was kind of moved over to the side, and the game went out. And that was it, and that was Yars Revenge. Now, another interesting thing about Yars Revenge results, which gives you another sense of what it's like to be at Atari, was you know, there's four segments you have. You have like young girls and young boys and adult women and adult men. And those are your four basic segments. And the name of the game at Atari was let's find a game that will appeal to adult women. And Yars tested high in all four segments, but the segment it tested highest in was adult women. So I said, okay, here's your game. This is the big testing game and it's, it, it, adult women like this game. They want to play this game. Let's go. And they're all excited. Oh, yes, this is breakthrough and stuff like this. Except they really believe that adult women want to play like shopping games and dressing games and stuff like that. So I asked somebody, I said, well, what are you doing? And so I look at the, here's the, here's the commercial for Atari. Here's the commercial. And you know the commercial, I mean, for Yars Revenge. Here's the Yars Revenge commercial. And it's a 10-year-old boy playing the game. And it's like, well, what happened to your market results? I mean, don't you guys use your own research? You know, and, and the guy looked at me with a straight face. He says, oh, women don't like to play space games. <laughs> I said, you just tested 100 people. They like to play. Goes, women don't like it. You know, you're, you're kidding yourself. You know, so, and that's, that. remember I said, Atari, when you expect things to make sense, you're losing touch with Atari. That's what was going on at Atari. That was amazing. Fortunately, somehow it still got out and people played it and dug it and that's, but it was the most tested game in Atari history. Uh, my favorite game, hands down, has got to be, and I just got 146,000 on it just before this talk, I have to say, not that I'm proud of that, is Robotron. 
Robotron is an amazing game, and right behind that, a very close second, and sometimes they switch off, would be Defender. And another part of the other game is Millipede. More so than Centipede, I think Millipede is a, Millipede is one of the few sequels that I think surpasses the original, which I think is a rare event. And when I was, when I was at Atari, I had my video triathlon, right? So when I came in in the morning, first place I'd go is the game room, and I didn't come out until I had gotten over 100,000 on Defender, Robotron, and Millipede, which usually didn't take more than a half an hour. But it was, uh, you know, well, it's a half an hour when you're playing video games. So... Yeah, those are my favorite games. And of late, I am a recovering Soda Crush player. I love that game. It's crazy. Speaking of sequels, how much would it take to get a Kickstarter going for a sequel to Yara's Revenge or E.T. or Raiders? Well, when you say how much would it take, are you talking United States dollars? For me to come back and do a 2600 game, no, no, I would. Or, or a 2600 or a full PC game. Or a full PC game. Well, either way. I, I promise you that if I were to get $3 million, I absolutely would come back and do a game. <laughs> now, I will not do the game for $10. And so at this point, we're just haggling. <laughs> What's that? So three, I'm serious here. Three million is your price. Oh yeah. Anybody who comes up with three million for me to do a sequel, or to do another game, I will absolutely do it. I will call up some of my clients and say, I, "Sorry, I can't come into work today. I have to make a game." <laughs> but I would absolutely do that. Absolutely. You promise to spend more than five weeks on it? <laughs> that is an excellent qualifier. Todd Fry, who witnessed the five weeks. Yes, I would, have, I would spend at least six and a half weeks on this game. I promise. Yeah. Um, so, would you say that Robotron is the limited edition of the Atari 2600, like you were saying, with the controller or whatever, just breeded more innovation and creativity during that time? In some cases, it invited it. Not everybody brought it, right? But to do a good game, you had to. You really had to, you had a lot to overcome, and that's what I liked about it. Making a good game on the 2600 is a very, very difficult task. And when you, when you feel like you've really done that, you really get a tremendous sense of accomplishment that lasts until you start designing your next game. And then you get renormalized, as they say. So I think I have time for one more question. And I think there was one way in the back. Did you happen to play the revised version of Yours Revenge? Oh, that's a good... Yes, I did. On the PS3? Yeah. Yes, I did. I have an opinion about that, as a matter of fact. <laughs> would, would you like me to share it with you? Yes. Okay. I did not care for that game. And here's why I didn't care for that game. It has nothing to do with the fact that nobody ever talked to me about that game. But that's okay. What I didn't like about that game was that it... Here's my concept. My, my concept for Yara's Revenge is it's a frenetic, really visually popping game experience. But it has to be frenetic, it has to be wild, it has to be omnidirectional. And what they did was the one thing I don't think you ought to do in a Yara's Revenge type game is they made it a rail game. So you don't decide how you approach the level and play the game. That game had a lot more stuff than I ever put in Yars originally, right? Of course. On the PS3 versus the 2600, it better have a lot more stuff than what it was. But the way they set this up, it just... I didn't care for the way they took control of how you approach and attack the game out of your hands. I thought that was a little late. So that bothered me. Let me give you one more thing about game design that I just think is a very interesting thing. There's a big difference between action games and adventure games. And this is something I learned on Raiders, is when you're doing an action game, if you do it well, you can have the play experience of the, of the player. You can have the same play experience as any other player on an action game, so you can judge the game. In an adventure game, think about this. 
If you have a game where solving puzzles is a part of the action, the person who makes the game, who knows the solution to the puzzles, can never have the play experience of the player. And that's a much harder thing to do. So I think adventure games are much harder to make than action games, but I do think that Yars Revenge sequel was not a good example of either. And that's what I'm saying. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate your time.